Hello and welcome to this week's GG Weekend Watch, where we have a big one for you this week. We have top class action yet again at Newmarket, really competitive races at Ascot, and just a small matter of the Arc de Triomphe at Longchamp on Sunday that we're going to sign off with. I will be looking ahead to the top class action with Andrew Mount and Rob Plumbridge, of course, as well. So we had better crack on with the racing. And we're going to begin at Newmarket with the 131, which is a Premier Phillies handicap, a 0 to 105 handicap for three year olds and over, over a mile two. So, Andrew, would you like to kick us off, please? Uh, not really. This is probably the trickiest <laughs> race of the day and uh, one of the ones that was sort of uh, um, least interesting. I, I did sort of have a delve at stats for this race and um, five of the six winners of this race had run over a mile two or a mile four last time out. So we've got a few horses stepping up in trip here from a mile, including the favourite Al Husson. Um, so maybe we can just take that one on in the hope that uh, stamina is an issue. Um, Susie's Shoes was one that I thought wasn't the worst each way bet in the world, having finished second at 25 to 1 here last time out, albeit a well held second. Uh, when Georgia Doby was up for the first time, I, I do like her as a jockey, particularly when she takes over from Charles Bishop, and I, I can see that one running well again. Uh, the other one of interest is White Willow, who uh, you chuck out a run at York, and um, she's had eight runs, three wins, and five places. Uh, the inside route was no help when she was third at Newcastle last time. And Richard Farr, he has won this race before. So I'll go White Willow over Susie's Shoes. But it wasn't a race that I was going to have a bet in. No, that's completely fair. But the two outsiders then of the field, White Willow 18 to 1, Susie's Shoes at 25 to 1. And Rob, sorry just to jump in there, but I have to because Andrew has stolen my thunder. So I may as well just <laughs> seem like I'm jumping on the bandwagon now <laughs> with the outsider of the field, with Susie's Shoes as well, 25 to 1. Admittedly, she does have to take a serious step forwards here and what she has shown. But I think there's still plenty of further mileage in this mark. She remains very unexposed. Worth siding with the three-year-old unexposed types in this race, understandably so, because we have mostly three-year-olds in this contest. Higher draws have been favoured in recent years, as have horses with a two-week turnaround. That's what Susie Shoes has. She also ticks the box for running well in a Class 3 handicap last time out. As you say, Andrew, she was far from disgrace within that for all that she was well held anyway when finishing second, dropped back in trip. Same mark, bottom weight, George Adobe again taking the ride. Was good enough for me to chance her as the outsider. So there you go. Andrew ruined it for me now, but I'm jumping in anyway. <laughs> Rob, are you also jumping on the bandwagon? No, I'm not. But okay, I, that's I, will, fine. <laughs> I, will, I will echo what um what Andrew said about this being a tough, tough starting mark. Um I was I was looking for sort of a clue, something that jumped out at me um as, as something being unexposed. And Crystal Australia was the one for me. Um <laughs> Looks like a classic sort of Sir Michael Stout filly. This he's just going to find bags of improvement. Um, broke a maiden last time, winning by four and a half lengths uh, in a big field, albeit in a class four handicap. Um, she was then purchased for a massive fee of like two hundred and seventy-five thousand guineas. It's a ridiculous sum of money for a horse who's, who's done that. Um, he's given her a little break, a little freshen up. She's, she's had a bit of time off the track, and I think she might have. Um, Probably didn't didn't want the ground as fast as it's been over the summer, so she gets a little bit of cut here. Um, I think she could find bags of improvement. I thought she was interesting at around seven to one, so it'll be a very small play. Um, as, as much as I think that the favourite is, you know, it's beautifully bred horse, um, is is probably a worthy favourite here. But I, I'll play her in the hope that there's uh, there's plenty more to come. Yeah, it's fascinating though, isn't it? Like you say, the fact she cost two hundred seventy five thousand guineas from the Rothschilds to now yeah. join these new connections. I mean, goodness me, yeah, that is a wild amount of money then for Crystal Estrella. But like it anyway, seven to one then for her. Completely see that argument that you've made for her. So up next, we have the listed Oakman in through six for three rows and over, over five furlongs at 151 at Ascot. I had to get the sponsor title in there, to be honest with you, because they're kindly inviting me along on Saturday uh, to, to the hospitality. So got to keep them sweet and all that. Uh, but this race itself is very open as expected, where Manakan heads the betting as a 4-1 to favourite. Rob, who do you like the chances of? Yeah, I think I need some sponsors like that. So if there's anyone, <laughs> anyone, it's, anyone handy, the it's who you know, Rob. <laughs> anyone, anyone watching wants to send me in hospitality, then um, please, please <laughs> fly within. Um, <laughs> yeah, th this is, like many of the races this week, so it's a really sort of tight uh, tight affairs, really. Um, 
the theme of my tipping this week, as you'll see as we go throughout the video, is forgiveness. And I've got to forgive a few runs uh, last time out. But the one I'm keen on here is Ebro River uh, for Hugo Palmer, who was in far too hot company last time in that group one over in Ireland. Um, he's probably not as good as we thought he was going to be. Um, but I reckon there is a, is a race like this uh, in him. Um, he's, he's around eight to one, I think. He's won once at Ascot. He's run the one to Ascot, um, where he was fifth in the Coventry a year ago. Wasn't beaten far. Um, he stays six furlongs, so, uh, you know, a really handy clip um, will suit him as he stays the ex extra furlong. Um, I'm sure he's got one of these in him. I know they think, they, well, they thought a lot of him at the, at, at the yard. Um, so, yeah, he he was my play here. I do like his marvellous. He's a pound lower from, from last year's win in this race, so... Uh, he's got lens calculations, but um, yeah, I thought Ebro River, the three-year-old, um, yeah, could, could shake things up here. Yeah, Ebro River, hopefully then, like you say, not going to be the horse necessarily that Connections thought he was, but there's still uh, definitely enough to like about his chances in listed company here. And at 8-1, that's fair. Andrew, your choice in the Oakman Inns Roost Stakes. Yeah, I can't believe you haven't got a um, sponsorship deal yet, uh, Rob. <laughs> So around about this time of the video, I like to have a cool, refreshing diet coke. <laughs> my, my, my friends at Coke have sent me another case. Mm. <laughs> really hits the spot. Yeah, but moving on, what, moving on to uh, this one. Um, I, I noticed the King's got a horse, King's Lynn. Uh, was yeah. known as Queen's Lynn until the events of um, the, <laughs> the recent, recent past. Um, but there, there were two horses for me. One I'm probably going to nap, and that is Ainsdale. Um, because it's the 1st of October on Saturday. And Ainsdale's got a fantastic record in the month of October. Four wins, two fourth places, and a, um, and a, and a sort of duck egg went 125 to 1 for the champion sprint last year. Now, uh, I put Ainsdale up for the um, for the six furlong group three, the uh, the Bengal stakes on this card last year. And um, he did us a big favour by finishing fourth at 28 to 1. And we got that extra place there. Um, coming back to five, well, remaining at five furlongs is um, not a bad idea, I don't think. And basically, the heavier the ground, the better. There is rain forecast, about seven or eight mil at Ascot on Friday afternoon. So with luck, there'll be plenty of juice in the ground come Saturday. Now, Ainsdale changed yards um, this season, uh, joined Julie Camacho, two respectable efforts, four at 50 to one, four at five to one, both at the wrong time of year for this autumn horse. And... Uh, I think he's going to run an absolute storm. He's run about 10 to 1, cracking effort. And the other one is Tis Marvellous, um, a horse Rob and I both liked um, at uh, Beverly a couple of runs ago. Now, he bombed out at Newbury last time, but he's had six goes at Newbury. He's lost every single time. Um, now, um, three times after running at Newbury, he's won at the next time of asking, including in this race last year. So we know he goes well in the second half of the season. We know he needs a, uh, a track with a stiff uphill finish like Ascot, Beverly, Newmarket, etc. So although he was well beaten in that race, um, going down by about seven lengths when seventh or twelfth at uh, Newbury last time, I think he'll run much better here. So uh, back Ainsdale, have a little saver on Tis Marvellous. There's your exacted. Don't say you weren't told. Lovely. I like it a lot that Ainsdale turned to on and another mention for his marvellous at 15 to 2 as well for Andrew as well as Rob. But I do like Rob's approach to his betting today with the story of forgiveness, because not only do you look like Jesus, but you're also exercising <laughs> the lessons he was trying to teach us as well at that stage, Rob. So keep that up, please, from now on. Right, we're over to Newmarket again, the next for the 206. This is £150,000. Tattersall's October auction stakes for two-year-olds over six furlongs and actually a lot more form to go on in a race of this nature than you might have expected. So, Andrew, two-year-olds to the four. Who wins, please? Yeah, this is a fun and game. So, you know, usually get like 30 runners spread across the width of the track for this race. I mean, traditionally on the rolling mile, it pays to be up with the pace, ideally against either rail. It tends not to matter which one. Uh, you look at this race, we've had a sort of fairly equal split between um, each side of the track. Although last year the winner came down the middle, but that one won by five lengths and uh, could have given him a fur on start, still won, I think. Um, there's a few interesting stats with this, basically. Um, it, it, horses who were in the top two in the betting last time out and finished first or second have done really well. Uh, winning five of, the, five of the seven runnings of the race from just 26 runners for a profit of £21.50. There's loads of qualifiers, um, you know, Sky Sail, Safari Dream, Girl Magic, um, among others. One I was interested in at big price is Uffington for Johnny Portman. Now, he almost won this uh, a few years ago with a 20-to-1 shot, 
which was um, part owned by some friends of mine who had um, uh, and just got run out of it close home. Now, Uffington, um, he does tend to hang to the right in his races. He's got he's run well at Kempton in the past. First time and only time he's gone right-handed. And he's drawn in stall two, so he's got that rail to his right, which could help him. I think he's around about 40 or 50 to one. He was uh, only sec he's second at Chepstow last time when he pulled hard in the field of eight runs. The bigger field will help. Um, so I'll go Uffington each way. Uh, another one worthy of a mention is a tricky customer trained by George Scott called Goume, who uh, is very difficult to win with. Did bolt up a camp a couple of runs ago when I kept laying them all the way around thinking he's never going to win a race because um, he sort of comes there looking likely to win and then sort of doesn't go through with it. He's second again at Subble last time. He's drawn high 26, I think, or thereabouts. He might be one of these ones that outruns his odds, you know, gets in the first sort of four or five at a big price. So uh, on the far side, Uffington, on the near side, uh, Goumet, but both at big prices. Oh, yeah, Uffington saw two, then 50 to one for Uffington, and then Goumet saw 26 at 33 to one as well. Either side then for Andrew in terms of the draws. Rob, are you taking a similar approach? No, this this is one of the races I was a bit cooler on this week, I'm being perfectly honest. But I do think Amici's the right favourite. Um, and, I, and I will put him up as a, as a small bet. I just think bidding for Hattrick after, you know, two good wins, crucially in big fields as well, um, I thought I thought read well. Um, that one, win at on the July course is working out fairly decent. There's been a couple of winners, including um, Eddie's boy, who won a Group 3 in France um, next time out, straight after that. Um, he beat a horse called Delirious Dream by two lengths in the race before that. Um, he's gone out and won twice, albeit in lower company. So, uh, yeah, I thought his, his form looked the most solid in the race. Um, and, yeah, he, he'd be a, a, a tentative selection, I'd say. A um, bit of respect for Union Court coming back in class as well, but I'll stick with Amici at the top of the market. Not very original, but um, wasn't too sort of invested in this race, if I'm being honest. I, I think that's completely fair in a race of this nature with these two-year-olds. Loads of prize money on offer. Who who knows, to be honest with you. So Amici, though, is probably pretty solid, though, at the head of the market. Therefore, Rob, if you had to have a selection, it is Group 3 action up next with the Cumberland Lodge Stakes for three-year-olds and over over a mile four at 225 back at Ascot, where Hamish is a strong fancy at 13 to eight, and it's high definition, second in the betting at 92. So Rob, how do you play this race? Uh, well, it's, well, it's a funny one. I do think Hamish is the, he is the right favorite here, but for obvious reasons, he's second to Kiprios, but he's just one of those horses. I I, I wouldn't want to back him at, at a short price like that. I, 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 there's just something about him, you know, in, in a better race with bigger odds that I'd back him. But in a as a, as a hot favourite, absolutely not. Um, I'd rather take a chance, and I'm going to take a chance on a horse who, like Hamish, I would would back at a big price at ten to one, but I wouldn't back him if he was favourite. And that's Third Realm. Um, this looks just about his level. He won a he, he's won a, his listed race. He won by six lengths. Um, beat a pretty useful horse in Lone Eagle um, by seven lengths that day. Um, he's got these sort of big performances in him and then and sometimes he goes and flops so at 10 to 1 i thought i'd, I'd give him a pop he's beaten adr before adr won the derby he ran really well in the derby so he's no mug he's, he's a talented horse i thought with a little bit of extra cut in the ground it might just pay and um it might be his day to uh put put in a big one so yeah third round would do i see the forgiveness theme tra yeah. transpiring now throughout but yeah, totally. Well, when they're 10 to 1, you can forgive them in a race of this nature for third yeah. realm. I like that angle in for Rob. Andrew, do you have a similar approach or are you looking more towards the head of the market? Yeah, very similar to Rob. When I first had a, a glance at this race on Monday for my Racing and Football Outlook column, that's Racing and Football Outlook available for more good news agents. Um, <laughs> what have I started? Uh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't that, you know, sort of enamoured with it. But now I'm thinking this is one of the best betting opportunities of the weekend because you've got a dodgy favourite here in Hamish and, or Hamish as our, our old friend Daryl Carter currently being blown <laughs> away in Florida would say. So, uh, But Hamish, he, he's not from two at Ascot. I mean, you could forgive both those runs. One of them, the first one he lost his shoe, the second one you could say perhaps he didn't stay two miles a bit. Um, but when he's been returned to, he's, he's got a great record when fresh. Uh, you know, he won first time out after uh, this season then we didn't see him again for several months until he ran that good second in Ireland last time. When he's been returned to the track within six weeks, he's had three runs, third, second and seventh, priced at seven to four on, seven to four on, six to four. So he's got chinned at skinny odds, skinnier than he is at the moment at 13 to eight. 
um, you know, every time he's come back from a recent outing. So he's obviously, you know, a little bit fragile, you'd suspect. 20-day break, a track he's never won at. I know we're talking sort of small samples with both those stats, but at the prices, I've, I've got to take him on. High, different, high definition is another one that I'm thinking, well, how, how is he 130 for this race? You know, he's only won, not won for two years, he's only won twice from a 13-race career, which for a group horse isn't great, and he's never won away from the Curra. So all of a sudden you're thinking, well, I can forget those two. Creston, I mean, Freddie and Martin Mead are hardly sort of prolific, you know, um, when it comes to strike rates this season. And I know Creston won last time out, but he's probably overrated, on, you know, just on the strength of that one next to his form figures. So I think you've got to be looking at everything in double figures. So, you know, Rob's made a great case for third round. Um, Get Shirty uh, was one that I liked. If it's soft, um, two and a quarter miles was too far at Doncaster last time out. He, you know, he likes it here. And uh, if the grain does get into the ground, he's got a great chance. And Candleford, uh, the, the William Haggis second string, two runs at Ascot, uh, second and first. Uh, he didn't run particularly well at Newmarket last time, fourth of six, but he's had three runs at Newmarket, um, got uh, run, run poorly every time. Uh, he was only 10th in the Ebor, but again, we know York's a Marmite track, and a lot of horses simply don't handle it. So if you look beyond that, you look at his Ascot form, and Candleford at 14 or 16 to one is another each way shout, really. So um so yeah i'll be i'll be looking for an upset here you know get shirty candleford you know on the spreads looking to buy the sp of the winner i think oh okay i like that a lot then good ways to play to play that race at Ascot. it's all the same and both of the lads are keen on taking those on at the head of the market and good cases against the ones that the head of the market made i mean i'm completely yeah converted and i am Hamish's biggest fan so much so that I actually pronounce his name the correct way as well Daryl uh but yeah that's a really interesting way of playing that race all the same now it is the big one on Saturday the group one Royal Bahrain Sun Chariot at uh 242 four three yards and over over a mile where we get to see Homeless Songs out again after we still probably haven't seen the best of her just yet but Will she be good enough to beat Saffron Beach is the big question so Andrew can you look away from Saffron Beach or how are you playing this yeah, I mean, she's fantastic, isn't she? She won this last year from the front, although she was drawn high and yeah, the stalls were on the stand side. And this time, you know, there's only nine runners. She has got the worst of the draw in store one. And you look at the other, uh, look at the pace of the races and a lot of other front runners sort of drawn between her and that rail as you just wonder what the tactics are going to be. It might not be easier for her to get across and do what she did in this race last year. So at six to four, given that doubt, I thought, I'll, you know, I'll take her on. Uh, much as I admire admire her, homeless songs, first time tongue tie, tr trying to win outside. I think run outside of Ireland for the first time. Um, not for me at the price. Laurel could be anything. Um, that one's been nibbled at today. Uh, six to one now wouldn't surprise me. I wanted to be against a prosperous voyage. I thought was flattered when beaten in spiral. Uh, that was a bizarre race on the July course where even though there was a small field, the draw had a major impact. Um, Frankie Detroit had Inspire on the slowest part of the track and that one reversed the form and they met in France next time. So I was just looking at the bigger prices. Well, it came down on the side of um, Lights On, um, you know, who's uh, a horse I've sort of, you know, put up a few times um, in her career. She, and, um, you know, she, she won her first time out at Sandown. Since then, she's run up against Baida Ascot. You can forgive that. You know, finishing six of seven and uh, last time out in uh, leopard town uh, just completely blew the start now you look at the rest of her form those two runs aside when she's had a smallish field um she's always run really well so first second or third so i, I thought you know tactically versatile uh, um, reasonable draw in store six a big price for a stout runner so i'll go each way lights on Okay, yeah, way to play this race. And like you say, on the back of that uh, finishing last in the matron last time out, though. But at 22 to 1, she has been readily dismissed for Andrew for lights on. Rob, who do you like? Well, I was in the same mindset as, as Andrew. I'm happy to take on Saffron Beach at 6 to 4, um, for sure, as much as, as Andrew said, she's a wonderful filly. But I'm going to forgive Homer Songs that last run. Um, I, I, they, they said they wanted soft ground. I don't think she liked it. Um, she was also returning from a layoff last time. I think you're going to see a much improved horse this time. Um, I'd, I'd expect plen plenty of improvement. She was six to one this morning, and even after declaration. She's now into eleven to four. That the money's come. Um, yeah, I, I, she, she, she. I'm, I'm quite keen on her actually. Um, I think you can take on like there's loads of money for Laurel, which I thought was 
I thought it was quite strange given what she's what she's done and back in you know a horse in the in the sun chariot a proper group one mm -hmm. after you know a couple just a couple of starts at Kempton I think I just thought that was I thought it was madness personally but you know each to their own and um, so yeah I'd, I'll go with the proven class of homeless songs to upset the favorite yeah in that first same tongue tie oh but Laurel's really pretty <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can't I was uh, I was on the radio last night when she won at Kempton, and I just remember thinking, "Wow, she's so pretty." <laughs> I can understand why people want to side with her and think that she's. Better You've got than... to have a got to have a system. Backing the prettiest horse is probably better than going number five. So. Oh, isn't it just Luke Elder? Yeah, exactly. So there you go. There's another <laughs> dig that we've managed to get in there at some point. Yeah, right. I'm gonna start siding with the prettiest horses from now on. But no, I don't. I just I can't wait to see that race unfold. To be honest with you, I haven't got a betting opinion in it. So I'm happy lads have covered it. Right back to Ascot for the Group Three Bengoff Stakes for three year olds and over over six furlongs at three o'clock. And back to you, Rob, to solve this one, please. Yeah, another tough one. Um, I think the the favourite sort of one of these sort of Charlie Appleby types that he's so good with the sprinters. He's done so well with like Naval Crown and, and you know, Creative Forces. Um, and that also looks sort of in, in that mould. Um, he has plenty of natural pace. Um, but I think there's a lot of pace in this race. And I think that's going to really set it up for Rohan, who's a horse I absolutely love. Um, he's got loads in his favour um, uh, on, on Saturday. Um, he's a dual Workington winner. Um, he's going to love this this early pace that's going to be that's going to be there. Um, faster the better for him. He gets his ground, gets his track. Um, he's ultra consistent, and um, yeah, I can't see him being out of the frame. To be honest, I think he'd be staying on late in the day, similar to how he was um, was at Haydock, and hopefully he's you know not going to bump into one like that and um, and take the spoils. I thought five to one, he was a good bet. Yeah, the late say five to one then for Rohan, who's just had a stellar stellar campaign. Andrew, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, Rohan is three from three over course and distance um, below group one level. Um, so it, it, it's got an obvious chance. He's never won after Royal Ascot, which is a slight concern, but I'm pro just been a bit picky and he has run some good races in defeat. Just look at the latest prices. Four to one is your absolute best now with Rohan. Um, as low as three to one in places, generally 137 to two. Um, so... Um, and again, there is, um, I mean, Friday at Ascot's going to be fun in games because there's winds of up to 45 miles an hour. It's not going to be quite as windy on Saturday, but it's still going to be into their faces in the street uh, up to about 28 miles an hour, the latest forecast I've seen. Um, if that is of a similar ilk or even stronger, then like you say, we, we know that it can be hard to make all the running on the straight course at Ascot anyway. It could be even more so uh, on Saturday. So, um, yeah, that, that angle with Rohan is uh, is quite um, persuasive. The other ones uh, I was looking at, Ventura Diamond, um, very similar form to Ainsdale. I think when they met in this race last year, Ventura was third and Ainsdale was fourth. I put them both up as each way bets in my column. And, uh, and then Ventura Diamond ran well in the champion sprint. I think Ventura Diamond could win the champion sprint, which is about 100, uh, 100 to 1 plus for that race. Yeah. But would need you know, genuinely sort of soft or heavy going. Now, if, if we get some rain, um, this one is going to run a big race. So I, I'm going to back that one at four, 40 to 1. Um, save on row one. A run to freedom was half interesting as well. Uh, but Henry Candy, who's last two um, runners won uh, at the time of writing, got the cheap pieces on for the first time. Six runs at this trip, three wins, a short head second, uh, a fourth on his seasonal debut this season, uh, and a duck egg in the platy jubes on 100 to 1. Um, so <laughs> oh. when, run to free, when Run to Freedom's had this trip in a realistic class level, you know, he's run extremely well. Uh, he probably doesn't want it that soft. Um, but he was, he was beaten the last time out. But you look at his record following a defeat within the same season, four wins from nine starts. So, um, yeah, Ventura Diamond and Run to Freedom, the uh, outsiders, 40s and 28s are back, and then I'll save on Rohan. Cool. Yeah, I like, like those angles a lot and throwing it further forwards as well than to a champion stakes potentially. Uh, just to realise, Rohan's in different colours, isn't he? He's got new ownership now. Previously owned by Chris Kiley Racing Limited. Now he's with Kieran McCabe and partner. I just sort of saw those colours, thought it looked a bit odd. Um, so yeah, that's in an interesting angle as well in there. Right, we have a new meeting joining us now at Red Car, which hosts the listed William Hill two-year-old trophy, funnily enough, for two-year-olds over six furlongs at 321. Plenty of likeable types. So Andrew, can you lead the way on the two-year-olds again, please? 
Yeah, the interesting thing about this race is that all the market principles as at the moment are drawn high. And uh, red card generally on the straight course, you want to be as close to that far side rail as possible. Mm. You get the occasional meeting where something odd happens and, and the bias flips. But certainly at the last meeting, if you weren't on that far rail, you were scuppered. I was about to use another word then, beginning with B, but um, it's a family <laughs> show. So you look, at, you, you look look at the, um, the the prices. You've got Cold Case in eight, Barefoot Angel eleven, Mayland C thirteen, Hulk Queen uh, fifteen, Lady Bullet sixteen. The first five in the market with well, only five horses priced in single figures are drawn eight or higher. I mean, Cold Case Trap eight might not be so bad, but you know we'll have some clues before this race from the early straight course races. And if it suggests that you you, know, you want to be lower that far side then I, I'd sort of start being imaginative and throwing a few quid at some bigger price ones. Misty Blues is interesting. Um, David Allen rides his course well. You'll, of, you'll often see them when the sort of stalls are in the middle. He'll just left hand down, go to that far side rail. Um, so that's uh, Misty Blues, 22 to 1. Um, and a funny story as well, two from two at this trip. Um, didn't stay some films in between for, for Rafe Beckett. He wouldn't have many runners up here, even in this race. So uh, yeah, stalls two and three, Misty Blues, and a funny story for me. Cool, low draws. Yeah, two and three then for that pair. And good price as well, Misty Blues, 22 to one, funny story, 10 to one. So Andrew is playing the draw, Rob. Are you taking a similar approach? No, I, yeah, I was, well, I'm taking a similar approach that I wanted to take on the top two. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, for all that they're, um, the reason that they're there is, is obvious. But um, I was interested, having I mean, a delve through the form of this, I found it quite a very difficult race to analyze, really. but. Having a proper scour like the professional that I am, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm interested in Washington Heights, um, mm. who's a steady improver for for Kevin Ryan. Um, he pushed, should have been a ring all the way on his last run. Um, he showed a brilliant, really brilliant attitude, just going down um, by a head, I think. And um, that rival then went and beat Bolt Action, who's a very solid horse and actually runs in about an hour since we're filming, and he's favourite for that. Um, Bolt actions, obviously, it's a really, you know, a very solid yardstick in, the, on, in this context and should have been a ring was fourth in the Mill Reef um, a couple of weekends ago and obviously no good, no, not good enough to beat Sakir, but he's now rated 100. And I thought that form tying into this race was, was pretty solid, actually. So at 10 to 1, I'm going to play Washington Heights. Cool, yeah, 10 to 1 then again, taking those on at the head of the market as well. So like that a lot. And now we have another super competitive handicap at Ascot now, which is the Challenge Cup, which is a heritage handicap for three rods and over, over seven furlongs at 3.36. And I'm going to kick us off here, lads, because I'm being very unoriginal, to be honest with you here, siding with Fresh. But Fresh really is the horse to beat for me here. And to be fair, he's still available at a fair price at 7 to 1 anyway in his bid for a hat-trick here, back over his favourite course in distance as well, where his last two wins were also gained over this track and trip. Again, he just has everything in his favour with a higher draw where this race tends to go to those drawn high. He's in 16 of 18 with just a £1 rise for his neck win from then last time out. Very fair. Hold-up style should be suited once more, essentially just keeping it simple as fresh as everything in his favour again. I am fearful, though, of River Nymph, and Ross Collin, who represent the biggest dangers for me. So it's fresh for me, Rob. Who do you like? Um, yeah, I can see the see the argument for fresh, definitely. Um, very, very worthy fav. Um, I was having a look at Safe Voyage, the old boy who ran an absolute screamer last time. Um, not a, a screamer enough, I know, for Darrell, who, who had backed him at 12. <laughs> he did, he, you know, jockey should have set, set off a little bit sooner. Um, but he, he showed signs of um, being back to his best. So... He was of interest to me, but the one that I do like is Blue For You, who's just ultra consistent, um, really suited by these big field handicaps. I've watched that that win at York last time where he only won narrowly, but he was short of room on about three or four occasions. He was weaving all over the place, didn't get any sort of proper momentum and still went and won. And that went down for me as, as a, a, a really smart performance. And I think he might have a bit more wiggle room in, in, in the handicap. Um, so yeah, he 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 was a play for me actually. Uh, at eight, although I do I I do think um, Fresh is, is a worthy favourite. But yeah, bl Blue for you will be the selection. Yeah, I like that from Blue for you, and especially off of this mark as well. Like I say, well, judged on the RPR from last time, it definitely looks as though he's got more wiggle room, even given the rise. So it's Blue for you for Rob with a, a bit of a mention then for Safe Boyd as well. Andrew, who do you like? Yeah, the good thing about this race is 
uh, Aratus, who was entered on um, Tuesday, isn't running um, because he's a uh, one. I keep tipping up in these big field handicaps at Ascot, and he keeps getting drawn on the wrong side. So yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on the claims of fresh. Um, it, it was a, a real frustrating so and so, wasn't he? He kept running well and um in placing in these races and getting chin did he just get chin by summer hand in a uh in a woking him once yeah uh, a couple of years ago. but yeah so danny tunnup seems to have found the key to it rohan rohan it was all oh, right of course yes good. so uh yeah i thought um yeah fresh was was solid and you look at the prices and you think well he's eights into sixes there's still plenty of um you know juice in the price at six to one i think from an each way perspective um the one i'll go with um though at a bigger price in the hope of the rain arising is as jad for the james horton yard i mean this one you know if you were sort of teaching people how to study um horse form um and, and just give them sort of puzzles like you do with sort of chess novices or chess puzzles you, you'd give them this one and say what does as jad need and you say well he's had four runs on good to soft or softer going and he's won them all maybe he needs good to soft or softer going uh, I, I stuck him up as a bet when he won at Doncaster last time, and um, if he gets good to soft or soft to go, and I think he might be able to make it five from five. He's sixteen to one. Um, maybe you want to wait on the weather and hope this forecast rain um, hits Ascot on Friday. Yeah, I, I just I love the idea of you giving your daughters um, just a puzzle piece of form, <laughs> exactly yeah. asking them exactly Homework. what this horse wants. <laughs> Why not? What? No, they've got a perfect education, therefore, and definitely the one that I will, yeah, <laughs> be giving my kids one day as well, I assume. God bless their souls and Lord help them at some point. Right, we have one more race to solve, and it's only uh, a small one, but I guess we'd better mention it, really. we better get it in there, there at the end, really. It's a group one, pre deluxe to trio, uh, four for three-year-olds and over, no geldings, over a mile four, at 3.05 on Sunday at Longchamp, where Luxembourg has found his way to the head of the market as a four-to-one favourite from the wonderful Alpinista in second at 11 to 2. Last year's winner, but rain has it come or has it come enough for Topato Tasso at 15 to 2. Title holder for Japan, trying to get that long awaited winner in the race for them. 9 to 1, 10 to 1 bar. So, Andrew, the 2022 arc, take it away, please. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Alpinista. Um, I mean, look, Morris gets on so well with her. He's, he's ridden her nine times now, eight wins uh, and a fourth beaten a length. Um, so, I'll side with her. Um, whether I'll be putting it off my column or not, I, I doubt it. These sort of prices with such a huge field and chance of trouble in running. Uh, the other one that I thought was quite interesting was uh, uh, German horse Mendocino or Mendocino, who um, seems to go well at this time of year. And uh, uh, check out his race course debut. He's had three runs in the autumn, two wins, and a second beaten three quarters of a length by Alpinista albeit perhaps Alpinista won with a little bit more in hand than the winning margin suggested. So if you like Alpinista, maybe that Alpinista uh, Mendocino form line you know, could be the way to go for the exacta. Or if you just want to throw a few quid each way at a big price, one run about 40s or 50s, Mendocino. Yeah, Mendocino 33 to 1 then. Like I say, we cannot be dismissing these German horses. We've learned that the hard way. And I mean, they've got a decent enough record in, in the arc then themselves, haven't they? So definitely cannot be dismissed in any way. Rob, the arc. Oh, yeah, I, you know, I'd love some Art Presque on Luke Morris to win the arc. I really would. Mm -hmm. um, Albanist is a, a yeah, she, she's she's a she's a great filly, but I, I, yeah, the price is a bit like Andrew. I, it's just a little bit short for me. I don't think it's a vintage arc, is it? Um, it does depend on how much of the cut in the ground. Obviously, with with Torquay de Tasso is very very solid, but if he wins back to back arc back to back arcs. You can't be calling it the best race in Europe, in my opinion. <laughs> Let's let's be real. Um, so, <laughs> so, I mean, when I was when I'm looking looking at the arc, I mean, the first thing first things first, it's got to have the distance, and I want a horse that's won at one mile four. So that knocked out Luxembourg and Bedini for me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Luxembourg may as well may well be good enough, and may may go and win. But the last ten arc winners have all won at the distance, and I think it. You know, if there's any doubts and doubts in his stam stamina, this ground. At, at Longchamp, if there is a little bit of rain, and and the you know the horses that do stay are going to be will be too much, and he'll get found out if he doesn't stay. And um, this forgiveness theme is is on running into the arc here. <laughs> and you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna ignore Westover's last run. Um, it was too bad to be true, to be quite honest. The tactics were weird from from Colin Keane. 
the reliable hands of Rob Hornby are back. Um, it, yeah, that was a really strange King George. I I, I put a line through it. Um, Westover was, you know, ticked to go over to the ledger. So he obviously, you know, he gets one mile four, maybe further. And that really appealed to me. Three-year-olds have got a half-decent record. Three of the last 10 art winners have been a three-year-old. Um, he fitted the profile of, of an art course. And uh, watching a few of the arts back, do you remember Workforce? I think he flopped in a King George, didn't he? And then he went and won the, went and won the arc in the same colours for, for Judmont. So Westover for me, um, all is forgiven. And I think he, he's, he's got a bit of class about him. So yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go with him. You're a much better character than I am. You are far more forgiving. This is, this is a lesson we could all, well, I say a lesson we could all learn. We'll see how the results go this weekend. Well, but potentially, <laughs> potentially a life lesson we could all learn to be more forgiving in life. And if Westover goes in, as well as Ebro River, then yeah, then we, we know that this is a parable that's now come true. Uh, like it though, 10 to 1. It does look like he's worth chancing on that basis. I'm going to chuck an Alpinista as well. I don't care about the price. She's wonderful. I'd, I wonder I wonder if Smart Prescott's actually going to bother to go over <laughs> if he's, if he's going to make the voyage or if he's actually going to just be on his phone ringing his owners. But I believe he's actually said he's already got um, her measured up for when her statue is going to go into the yard then after this as well. So I hope so. She can defy the the five-year-old mare um, negative trend then for her to actually go and win. So, Rob, back to you, please, for anything from anywhere else. Yeah, I've got one this week. And, and you know, Adib in the pre-dollar, um, so the forgiveness, you know, he, he hasn't had anything his way this year. Hasn't had, you know, it's been, it's been a hot, dry summer. He's never had his ground conditions. He's never had, like, the strong pace that he needs. Um, he's got the favourite to beat in the pre-dollar on, on Saturday. But... Mm -hmm. He's, he's a pretty classy individual when he wants to be and crucially for him he travels really really well you know he's a, he's a globe trotting star so that's not going to phase him um a lot, a lot there's been a few high profile horses that have gone over to france and just don't like traveling he's not one of them um and i think haggis will have him absolutely spot on for this he was seven to one which i thought was big in, in a in a relatively small field for that race in the pre-dollar um the the favorite you know, obviously won really well last time and, and is, is improving all the time. But the old boy, Adi, uh, to win the pre-dollar for me. Oh, like it. Yeah, so the pre-dollar comes up at four o'clock then at Longshop on Saturday and a day of then to be putting his jet-setting credentials to good use again for Rob. Andrew, anything from anywhere else? Um, yeah, uh, Red Car 537, the last race on Saturday. There's two horses that are, I, I want it to back. Um, but both are drawn high, so it's a case of watching the earlier races and seeing whether that's going to be a big disadvantage, which it might well be. There are Renthorpe, who's a real autumn horse, and Prospect, who ran well from a bad draw at air last time. Um, if, if those draws prove insurmountable, then Renthorpe will probably be out at Nottingham soon, where it goes really well. Um, in the 2.15, a long shot on Saturday, the Prix de Cadran, uh, Tash Khan, our old friend who... Uh, mm. Uh, often runs well at big prices. He needs cut in the ground, ideally. They keep running him on quick ground, probably because he can pick up sort of prize money for finishing sort of second, third and fourth in races he can't win. And um, he hasn't had ground on the soft side of goods since finishing second to Trushan in, uh, on Champions Day last year, went 50 to 1. He's got the cheap pieces on for the first time. If it is soft in that two and a half mile race, he could get, um, run well, you know, maybe finish second to Kipri also reward each way support. And um, uh, Kinross is running as well. We, um, Rob, Rob's tip one of Rafe Beckett's uh, at Longshot on Sunday. He's just had, he's had the first three winners at Salisbury today, Rafe Beckett. Um, oh, nine to one, 13 to two and five to one. The, the yard's red hot. So yeah. Uh, yeah, Kinross might be able to keep his run going um, in that seven furlong. What is it? The, uh, All right. Uh, uh, yeah, the pre dollar for it or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the seven furlong race and it just looks like it's his sort of race, doesn't it? Everything in his favour. Seven furlong champion that he is, a Kim Ross, but the first time cheap pieces, Tashkan, and also a bet in the last race at Red Car for Andrew as well. So Andrew, back to you, please, for your nap of the weekend. Uh I'll go Ainsdale and Escort in the Ralph Stokes. Oh, cool. Okay then. Rob. Uh I'll have uh homeless songs in the chariot like it a lot and i will go fresh then in the 336 at ascot as well so yeah there's a bit of a blend and a bit of a mix for you then from all of the action this weekend a big thank you to the lads as per usual for all of their hard work enjoy the action this weekend and best of luck with your bets